Okay, hello, hello everyone. Um, today we have a very special uh, episode about uh, the data area and data leaks. Today we have Alex, our guest in the channel. I think this is our first time to have um, English, pure English like uh, episode. So I need to welcome Alex. Hello, Alex. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, okay, so. I will first, before we start to introduce what we'll talk about, I will ask Alex if you can just give us some introduction about yourself and to introduce yourself to the audience. Sounds good. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Merced. I'm a developer advocate for Dremio. So I spend a lot of my time uh, basically traveling, uh, cre creating content, whether audio, written, uh, particularly around the Data Lake House, Apache Iceberg, around Dremio, um, basically around data in general. Um, so. Uh, I get, I get, to, I get to write code. I get to, to educate about it. I get to talk about it. I, I can't, I, I can't be happier. But uh, I'm very, I always like just to kind of help people learn how to implement really cool new cutting edge data architectures, and that's sort of my role in life these days. Okay, and one more important point, which is, by the way, I first know Alex from his book about about the iceberg oh, yeah. guide. Uh, it's a very nice book. I started with this book when I was working at AWS. When I need to start design some leak house solutions for the customers, I need to do some research about how to get more details about this uh, tool. Like it was famous, and a lot of people starting um, talk about it. So I go through your book. It's a very nice book, by the way. I recommend everyone to read this book. Um, and so before we start, I, I just need to give um, some background about from where we get the idea from for Iceberg. So like how we got the starting of Iceberg. Can we give some introduction at this point before we start? Or we need to share sure. screen directly? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll also cover this a little bit in the presentation. But bottom line is uh, we have... Um, Basically, we li we live in a world where basically we want to not have to move the data as much. The reason being is because right now you're moving the data from source systems, then to a data lake, then to a data warehouse, and every time you move the data, it takes more time, and it costs more storage because you're making more copies of the data. It costs more compute, so you have costs, but also the time that it takes to get to the data, uh, to your BI dashboard, to your reports, to your AI AIML model gets extended. So the idea is if you can narrow down how far you have to move the data to get it to the end, um, you're gonna be able to deliver that data faster and cheaper. Um, so Apache Iceberg enables for us to do the kind of things we would do in a data warehouse, but directly from the data lake, turning the data lake to the data warehouse, AKA the term data lake house. And that's why it's so important. So, so I will let you to start now and we can, we, uh, we will ask this question later, okay? Okay, sounds great. I will begin. Okay. Uh, hey, everybody. Again, my name is Alex Merced. I'm a developer advocate at Dremio, and here I'm going to talk about an Apache Iceberg deep dive. So by the end of this presentation, we'll know what Apache Iceberg is, why it exists, what, how it works, and uh, all the benefits of Apache Iceberg. Okay, again, my name is Alex Merced. I'm a developer advocate at Dremio. I've spoken at many events. Um, I'm also the co-author of Apache Iceberg, the definitive guide. So if you want to get yourself a uh, free copy, you can just scan this QR code right here to get an early release copy. Okay, uh, I'm also the host of several data podcasts. So here are the different podcasts that I am the host of. You can subscribe to all of these on Spotify and iTunes. I also have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Alex Merced Data, where I create a lot of tutorial videos on different data topics, uh, Polars, um, Apache Spark, Apache uh, Iceberg, all these kinds of things. Um, basically, again, I'm going to be talking about Apache Iceberg. One of the best things you can do is kind of get hands-on. So while I will be doing a future episode where we'll talk about getting hands-on with Apache Iceberg, I also have this exercise here. You can scan these QR codes to, to kind of get started and kind of see an example of working with Apache Iceberg on your own. This is an Apache Iceberg 101 article where I created curated many links to many great Apache Iceberg uh, resources around the web. This is a video playlist I have about Iceberg Lakehouse Engineering, showing you how to kind of do things with Apache Spark, with Dremio, and working with Apache Iceberg firsthand. And with that out of the way, uh, let's talk about what is a table format. Because at the end of the day, what Apache Iceberg is, is a table format. So we need to understand sort of the, the what it is before we can talk more specifically about Apache Iceberg. And bottom line is, the reason why we need a table format is because we want to do more work on a data lake. So generally we have our database systems and we have our data warehouse systems. We usually use oftentimes our databases for uh, operational work. 
So, you know, to serve our applications, to serve uh, internal business systems, where generally we're adding records, deleting records, things like that. And then we move that data into analytical systems like the data warehouse that structure the data more in a columnar format that, are, that whose systems are optimized for analytical workloads. But the thing is that those systems, they abstract away everything. So how is the data stored? What kind of metadata is kept track of, of on that data? Uh, how it processes that metadata and data? Uh, all of that is abstracted away. So we have no idea how it works. We just know that if we put the data in the database, the data warehouse, I can write some SQL and I can query it, okay? Um, which is fine, but we run into a world where uh, we need to use more than just one tool, okay? So there's no one database or data warehouse platform that, that can really serve all our use cases. So what we would like to do is to do to have one place where we store our data. So up till now, the, play, the sort of intermediate place where we just kind of dump all our structured and unstructured data was the data lake, and we would just dump all these data files. Okay, and there's a place where we can actually see how the data is stored. But running analytics on the data lake hasn't always been the most fun or the most fast or the most easy to do. So people really haven't used the data lake as the center of their analytics, just more so as sort of a dumping ground of data. So in order to be able to use it more like a database and like a data warehouse, those layers that are generally abstracted away in a database or a data warehouse need to be created. So we have the file storage. So we do have a way of, you know, we do have ways of storing files over a distributed system. That's object storage. Okay. So we think S3, ADLS, Minio, um, and we have a file type that makes it, that's really optimized for analytics. That's Parquet. But how do I recognize all those Parquet files on my object storage as a table? And that's where a table format comes in. What a table format does is that it's going to create a metadata layer that allows us to recognize multiple files that are sitting on our data lake as a single table. And with the use of that metadata, we're going to be able to do things like time travel, have acid transactions. So now there's different ways of kind of getting to this, of creating this. But the idea is that we're going to have some collection of data that allows us the query engine, like a query engine like, like a Dremio, Apache Spark, uh, some sort of tool like that to be able to recognize this group of files as table A or this group of files as table B. Okay, so that's what a table format is. There's different ways of doing that. So the original table format was a form format that was part of the Apache Hive project. Now, Apache Hive was originally created because when working with data lakes, before there was object storage, you would use uh, HDFS, Hadoop file system. And generally, if you wanted to write analytical jobs on the Hadoop file system, you'd use a framework called MapReduce, which require you to write these analytical scripts in Java, uh, which was not the easiest thing to do. So to make it easier, because what people prefer is SQL when it comes to just writing queries. Um, so they created Hive, which allowed you to write SQL and that SQL would convert into MapReduce. But in order to write SQL, you need to have the concept of a table. So in that case, um, the Hive table format was created because it had to kind of create a way for it to be able to recognize what is the table on your Hadoop file storage. So the approach they took was that we'll say, hey, this folder, so let's say we have a folder called table A, any files in that folder are table A. All the files in folder table B are table B. Okay, so basically it wasn't based on the files in the table, it was based on the folders that made up the table. And then you would have your partition folder. So you would split up the table. So maybe I split up the table by like months and then each month would have a folder and these were referred to as partitions. And this made it easier to run faster queries. And then you would have a Hive Metastore that would keep track of the folder and the partition folders. But everything was based on folders, not files. So then we moved over to sort of a new direction where instead of a folder-based approach, all the modern table formats, like Apache Iceberg, they take a file list approach. So instead of listing what directories are part of the table, they're going to be able to create lists and curate lists on the individual files of the table, including metadata on those individual files that can be used to much more efficiently query the table. So again, there's multiple formats that take this newer approach. But again, there's different benefits in how the architecture is, and that's what makes Apache Iceberg special. 
Okay, so now let's get more into Apache Iceberg. Again, now we know what a table format is, and Apache Iceberg is a table format. How, what is specifically Apache Iceberg? Now, the Apache Iceberg project specifically is a table format standard. Its goal isn't to do everything. Its goal is to do one specific thing, and that is to create the standard for how the metadata is ran. Okay, so any tool that, if you follow the standard, can write the right metadata, so that way all other tools that know how to read the standard can read those tables written by any tool. So any table, any any tool can write an iceberg table, and any tool can read an iceberg table if they follow the standard. So it's a, it's all a specification. It's a standard for how the metadata is written. Now, of course, we want to encourage tools to be able to write to this standard. So the Apache Iceberg project includes sets of APIs, so sets of libraries, sets of basically code to help tools incorporate the use of that standard. Okay, so there's Java libraries, Python libraries, where in the, there's the early stages of a Go and Rust library for working with Iceberg. And basically what these libraries do is they provide the functions and um, the basically, yeah, the basic the functions and classes and tools to begin writing uh, the metadata. So that way, any tool written in that particular language that wants to incorporate Iceberg doesn't have to rewrite all of this functionality. They can just use the built-in uh, Iceberg libraries to add Iceberg functionality to their tools in writing and reading the metadata. Apache Iceberg is not a storage engine. It's not where you store your data. You would store your data in a storage system like S3, Minio, ADLS, some sort of distributed file system. Um, it's not an execution engine. It's not what processes our query, okay? Um, the query would be processed by um, like something like a Dremio or Apache Spark. It is not a service, so you don't have to actually deploy Iceberg. It's not a software that you run, okay? So you don't have to like set up a, a, a cloud instance that's running 24-7 with some sort of software for you to use Apache Iceberg. It's just a standard for how the metadata is written, and that standard needs to be understood by the tools that you use, like Apache Spark, Dremio, that know that when they write a table, this is how you write the metadata, and when you read a table, this is how you read the metadata. Okay, now, so how, how does that all work? Okay, so what is this standard? So let's talk about what this standard looks like. So essentially, this is sort of the epitome of the visual of how the Apache Iceberg standard is. Okay, so typically what's going to happen, let's think about it from the perspective of the query engine. So let's pretend I'm Dremio, and you're running a SQL query on Dremio to query a table that is an Iceberg table. So... Typically, what you're going to do is you're going to have a catalog, okay? And your catalog is essentially going to be the directory of all your iceberg tables. So in the same way that a phone book lists, hey, here's somebody's number and then their phone number, so that way I can contact them, each catalog doesn't actually have the table. It has the name of the table and the location of where that table can be found, okay? So Dremio would go consult the catalog and say, hey, I'm looking for table one. And this would generally have a reference to where it's located in the file system. So it might have an S3 address, an HDFS address, some sort of location um, pointing to a what's called a metadata file. And this metadata file basically is the high-level definitional file of the table. This is going to define the table schema. So again, we start with the catalog. And once the catalog tells us where that table is, then we go to the metadata file. And again, the metadata file is going to have like where, um, what is the current a snapshot of the table? What is the partitioning of the table? What is the schema of the table? So all these like definitional pieces are in this metadata file. Not only does it include uh, these things, but it also includes the history of these things. So I can see what is the schema now? What are the historical schemas? What is the current partitioning? What is the historical partitioning? Um, what is the snapshot, the current snapshot? What are the historical snapshots? So you have this sort of big picture here in the metadata file. So using, if you use a metadata file, it should have all the information you need to be able to construct the table from any point in its history that is currently active. So in this case, we're going to assume that we just set a standard query, which is going to default to the current snapshot. So what happens is that once Dremio, so again, just to kind of recap, uh, Dremio went to the catalog, said, hey, I'm looking for table one. The catalog said, hey, here's the file. Okay, we read the file. And now we know that 
we want to query the current state of the table, and that's going to be located in this file location, which is called a manifest list file. Now, each manifest list file represents one snapshot, so one moment that the table existed. And basically, every snapshot is made up of multiple manifests. So each manifest file, so these files right here, represents a group of individual files. Okay, and so basically, a manifest list is the list of the groups that make up the table. Now, typically, a lot of these groups, these manifests, will represent files that cover data within the same partitions. So Dremio, when it's reading the manifest list, can actually see different uh, statistics or metadata on each group of files. And based on the partition values, can begin pruning and saying, hey, I don't need to scan this file. Hello. Uh, I have a question here. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we manifest file, it is a version of the data. So if I have a snapshot from the data today and we have inserted a new um, a new update or delete or new file. So we will have a new version of the manifest file. Uh, correct. So basically what would happen is that let's say we do an insert uh, uh, on a new table. So it's going to first, the first thing that it's going to do is going to essentially do the opposite. So when we read, we work from the top down. When we write, we work from the bottom up. So we would write the di data files first. And then based on the data files that are currently in the table, if they're part of an existing manifest, then we'll just reuse that manifest. Um, assuming the manifest hasn't changed at all. Like none of the files got are no longer used in that manifest. Now, if that manifest cannot be reused because a file in that uh, manifest is no longer being used or something like that, it'll rewrite it. And then that manifest will be included in the next manifest list. So this manifest here right now currently belongs to this snapshot and this snapshot. Um, so manifest will be reused if all the files in there are part of the current of the next snapshot. Um, let's say one file changes, then it will rewrite the manifest without the file that got removed with the new file that got added, and then add that to the next manifest. The files aren't deleted though. So in that case, that old manifest is still there and those old, uh, so that way I can scan the, the prior snapshot and do time travel. And the catalog will automatic scan or query the latest manifest file. Uh, yes. Yeah. So basically what's going to happen is that when I scan, it's always going to go to the newest manifest list, unless I specify otherwise. And that newest manifest list is going to have the list of the current manifest files. So in that case, um, I'm never going to see the old ones if I'm scanning the current snapshot. But I could do time travel and I can say, hey, I don't want to read the newest snapshot. I want to read the oldest snapshot. And then it'll go to this manifest file, which will point to these manifest lists, and it'll curate the scan from there. Um, so basically, you have this active history because Iceberg never deletes files. It's always adding files. Now, there are cleanup operations you will do later on to make sure that doesn't get out of control. But basically, when I'm just doing normal inserts, deletes, updates, it's not going to delete files. It's just going to create new files so that way the current state can be replicated. Um, and then once it's done, it's always going to update the catalog to say, hey, we had to create another metadata file. So if I do another transaction, I would create a third metadata file. And then we would update the catalog to point to the third one afterwards. Um, and then that's how we always make sure we're looking at the most up-to-date version of the table. OK, it's clear for me. Thank you. OK, perfect. Um, but just to recap, so when I read, so if I'm Dremio reading the table, I would first consult the catalog and say, hey, what's the newest metadata? That would point me to the latest metadata. And then that would point me to whatever snapshot I want to look at. From the snapshot, I can then begin pruning partitions. And once I've pruned all the partitions or all the manifests that I don't need, then I can read the remaining manifest files. And these manifest files contain data on the individual files and contain stats on each column. So now based on my query, I can actually determine which files I need to even bother scanning. So at this point, we've scanned no files yet, but I've already reduced the number of files I have to scan. So the end result is that there may be a thousand files in this table, but because Iceberg's metadata, we only need to scan 20, which is going to make our query much faster to get to the same place instead of scanning all the data because we're able to eliminate unneeded partitions and we're able to eliminate unneeded files using those column statistics. So, we're able, so basically, we can plan the query smarter to have a faster query, which really pays off on really, really large data sets that are well partitioned and well sorted. I have one more question. Okay. How we collect these statistics, like while we are writing the files or it's a separate process? 
Um, it's done when you're writing the file. So essentially what happens is that when it writes the parquet files, the parquet files generally have a uh, row and file level statistics. So essentially what it's doing, it's rolling up those statistics. So it's going to aggregate all the parquet uh, statistics into the manifest files. And then the manifest file statistics get rolled up to the manifest list to create those 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 sort of manifest level statistics. And then those will get rolled up to any table level statistics in the metadata file. So essentially it's just different levels of rolling up the, the data sets. Okay, so it's aggregation of the parquet statistics, correct? Exactly right. Okay. Thank so that's why it's able to do it fairly quickly because those statistics will already exist. So it's just rolling them up. Yeah, exactly. Cool, cool. But yeah, so that's essentially how it works. Now, in a standard Apache iceberg table, so again, the cool thing about Apache iceberg table is that it doesn't have to be written to a particular directory structure, which is different than the other table formats, which has some pros and cons. Uh, big pro, I'll talk about a little bit later on. But generally, if I were to just use sort of like a what's called the file system way of writing Apache iceberg tables, um, what it does is going to create a data folder. So I will we'll see a little bit later that when I take a look at my data, I'm going to have a folder called data that has you know my partition folders, all my data files, and I see a metadata folder. And that's where you're going to find all those files that we just talked about, the metadata files, the manifest lists, and the manifests. So as you can see, metadata files are JSON files, OK, because uh, it just tends to have this um, a variety of information. Then we're going to have our manifest list files, which are Avro, because you're going to each row, because basically the, da the data is in rows, and each row represents um, a particular manifest. And same thing for the, the, the manifests, where each row, which is why we're using Avro, Apache Avro files, um, each row represents an individual file. Okay, so in those cases, you're doing more row level operations, so it makes sense to use a more row based format. Now, again, just to recap, again, basically the read path is. You go to the catalog. The catalog points you to the metadata file. That's going to point you to the manifest list for the current snapshot. And then that's going to point you to all the different manifests that have files that are related to your query. And then basically the query engine can then filter which files need to be queried from there. And it's just the opposite if you write a file. We would write the data files, write manifests, then make a manifest list from those manifests, then write a new metadata file, then update the catalog. So it's basically you go down when you read, you go up when you write. Um, Cool. So that's the architecture. Like that's that's how it's working under the hood. Now, again, at the end of the day, your tools are going to handle all that. Okay. Having an appreciation for that makes it easier to work with Apache Iceberg format. But again, oftentimes you're not going to be the one writing that specific metadata. Uh, your query engine, like a Dremio, Spark, Flink, etc., is going to generally handle that work for you. And the benefits you get because of this structure is you're going to be able to much more efficiently make smaller updates. Because back in the days of Hive, if I were to update like one record in a partition, it would actually have to rewrite the entire partition. Because essentially what it would do is it would create a new folder, rewrite all the data files for that partition in that folder, and then swap out the folders using the Hive Metastore. So it would be really, really inefficient to make really small updates. But with Apache Iceberg, instead of updating a whole partition just for one record, you would update just the file where that record exists. So it would create a new file and you would just be replacing that file, which is going to be a much more lightweight operation. You have snapshot isolation for transactions. So each transaction is going to be isolated, and you can time travel back to those snapshots. And basically, it's collecting metrics as you go. So you don't have to uh, run queries to generate table statistics. The table statistics are always in the table based on the current version of the table. So in that case, you always have uh, current statistics. And actually, because of that, there's all these metadata tables that you can generate uh, from the table. Um, basically, th these are just these tables derived from the stats in the metadata uh, that allow you to kind of monitor like the size of your table, uh, the balance of your partitions. There's a lot of really cool ways you can use them um, that, uh, that give you a lot of really visibility into your table. Um, allows you to do table evolution. Another big thing, like something we take advantage or we not take advantage of, we take for granted uh, when we use um, databases and data warehouses is that I can add a column, I can subtract a column, I can rename a column. You know, that's not so necessarily simple in all reality. And Apache Iceberg makes this very easy to do that we can update the schema of the table without having to rewrite the table. We And more special is we can update how the table is partitioned without rewriting the table. And because we're always using that catalog to point us to where the current metadata file is, all engines, since they're all communicating with the same catalog, will always see a consistent view of the data. And because of that, you have asset transactions. So the recap, 
because we have the catalog, the engine's always going to consult the catalog to point to the right metadata file for that table. That's why all engines, so if I make an update on Dremio and then I query the table with Spark or vice versa, they're both going to see the same version of the table. You're always going to see whatever the most recent completed uh, successful version of the table is. Again, you're going to have schema evolution because the schema is kept track on the metadata. So even if the old data is written with an old uh, schema, okay, when the file data is read, the engine can then impose the new schema on the data and, and, and basically uh, return to you the, the data in the right format uh, based on what it read in the metadata. Okay, so it's all metadata operations. Improved performance. Again, because the engine can use the metadata to reduce the number of files that you're querying. So let's say this is the, the whole data set. Based on the metadata, we might only scan this these files here, which reduces um, the amount of time that we're going to have to scan the query. And not only are you reducing the time, because you can also reduce the time by just having a faster computer, but faster, more powerful compute usually costs more money. But just scanning less files, well, that saves you money. So Apache Iceberg is also saving you money while improving the performance of your queries. And then again, updating your partitioning scheme um, is something you can do in Apache Iceberg that you cannot do in any other format. So basically, if I was partitioning the table by month, and then later on, I decide, you know what, we're getting more and more data faster. So I want to start partitioning the data by day. I can just make that switch without having to rewrite the whole table. In other formats, you would oftentimes have to rewrite the entire data set to apply the new partitioning. Here, what will happen is any future data will have the new partitioning scheme applied. And I can rewrite the old data if I ever care to. Okay, there's going to be rewrite operations we can run. And any data that's ever rewritten gets rewritten with the new partitioning scheme. But we don't have to. So the idea is you have a choice and you can do it on your own time. And you don't have to necessarily bear the cost of rewriting the whole table up front. Because how any particular data is partitioned is all tracked in the metadata. And uh, the the engines will know how to kind of read that metadata to plan around how that particular file set file was partitioned. And another really cool feature is hidden partitioning. So to appreciate what makes this really awesome is let's take a look at how things used to work in Apache Hive. So in Apache Hive, we would have when we created a table, let's say I have a timestamp field. If I wanted to partition the table by month, I would have to create a new month field. So that means every time I did an insert, I would have to make sure to transform the timestamp field into like a number for the month, okay, in order to capture that extra column so I could partition by it. And then my analysts, every time they were to query the table, not only would they have to query the timestamp or filter by the timestamp, they'd also have to filter by the month column which is not the most intuitive thing in the world. It's like, wait a second, doesn't the timestamp column kind of already do the trick and specifying what I want? Well, it's because Hive doesn't know that, it's part, you know that relationship between the two columns. It just doesn't understand that these two things are related. So in that case, if I forgot to filter by month, I would do a full table scan. So you ended up with accent of full table scans. It was more work in the engineering because you have to remember to generate that month value. It was just more work. With Iceberg, when I partition the table, I don't have to create another column. I can actually just say, hey, I'm partitioning by months, but it's based on the timestamp column. So now the metadata is aware of the relationship that we are partitioning by month, but it is a function of that timestamp column. Okay. So since the metadata is aware of this, now in the future, when my analyst queries just the timestamp column and filters just by the timestamp column, the engine knows to take advantage of partitioning. So it's less likely that the analyst is going to make an act, make a make a mistake that results in a full table scan, and that's the beauty of this feature. It just makes it where writing the SQL is going to be much more intuitive, and you get these cool functions for your partitioning that are pretty useful because there's also functions for like bucketing and um, truncating values. And Mustafa. Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> okay, so how automatic like uh, iceberg will get to transform this? Like my understanding is the buckets are. Uh, partition by dates, for example. So if the analyst needs to his or his version of the table to be by months, is this means we will have another external table for the analyst, which would be use uh, metadata or how this would be utilizing oh, the partitioning? Oh, it's all in the metadata. So technically, there would be the the physical partitioning of the data doesn't matter. Like all the all the full all the files theoretically could just be in one big folder. 
what matters is going to be uh, the, the the manifest that lists those files. And what's going to happen is that each of the in the in the manifest at the manifest level, um, it's going to track the partition stats. So it'll actually apply the transform and have the transform value in the metadata. Um, so that way you can capture, okay, hey, saying, hey, this file, it'll say, hey, this group of files, like this partition, this manifest list or this manifest was partitioned by month. And then these file, and then basically it covers, you know, these partition values from this range to this range. So then basically based on my query, Dremio can be like, okay, this manifest was partitioned by month. And this is the range of values. Does that apply to my query? And then this manifest over here was partitioned by day because it was written later on. And it, it covers this range of values. And then based on the range of values, it can then determine whether it needs to scan it or not and go forward. So it, it's it's all in the metadata. So in that case, the files don't need to be written any differently. So you mean if like we have two different query patterns for the same table with different like dates mm -hmm. parts, so we will not create a new table like Hive. We will have a new like create a new table, but it will not create physical data that will be the same, and it will utilize the catalog metadata to query the data. Correct. Exactly. Exactly right. Basically, okay. yeah. Because for each manifest, it actually tracks how the table was partitioned at the time that it was written. So that way it knows how to calculate the stats for that particular manifest um, and vice versa. So basically it'll know which files were have the old partitioning scheme, which ones have the new one and apply the right type of planning for that particular file. Okay, thank you, it's clear. Cool, cool. Um, next, and then just again, benefits of Apache Iceberg, you have uh, partition evolution. Uh, again, we talked about that. That's where you can evolve the partitioning. And, uh, and hidden partitioning, which we just talked about a moment ago. Then there's compatibility mode. So this is very key. Because again, Iceberg doesn't plan it based on the way your files are listed. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to have all the files in separate partition folders like you would normally in Hive and other formats. Because it's not looking for those files based on the folders that they're in. It's looking based on the manifests and where the manifests say those files are. So they can be anywhere. So the benefit of this is, is particularly in object storage. Because in object storage, what can happen is that if you have a bunch of files in the same folder, often known as a prefix, what can happen is that that object storage provider, like an S3, might reduce the performance of a bunch of requests to the same prefix. So by being able to distribute your files across more folders, regardless of how the table is partitioned, which you'll see a little bit later on because Dremio does this by default, is that it you're going to avoid um, those reductions in speed. Okay, so that's that's really cool. And again, this is not something, when you're using Dremio, you don't even have to turn this on. It's just an automatic, that's how Dremio is gonna write the tables. Okay, uh, which will, which I'll point out when we, we when we, in, in during uh, the episode where we'll do a demonstration. Okay, uh, you have a wide ecosystem. The biggest reason to patch Apache Iceberg in, specifically is because of its huge ecosystem. Okay, well, there's other formats that kind of achieve the same sort of data lake house table format. Uh, Apache Iceberg has one of the widest amount of not just read support, not just tools that read the table format, but tools that can write to the table format um, and not just write to the table format, but optimize your tables, whatnot. You're not just stuck with one choice for any aspect of the table. And that's the beauty of it. It's not like other formats where either you only, where well, you generally only have one main option to handle um, a lot of the services, even though maybe many tools can read the table format, oftentimes in sort of the data management side, you'll just generally have one provider. Um, oops, let me go back. Okay, here we go. Data as code. Uh, I mentioned this again a little bit later on, but there's another open source project called Project Nessie that provides a catalog that's specifically built for Apache Iceberg. And what it does, it actually captures and versions those changes to the metadata file. So that way you can not only time travel and version your individual tables, but you can time travel and version your whole catalog. Okay, so in this case, you can isolate changes to your at the catalog level. So basically, let's say there's a mistake and you've made, you know, you ingested bad records across several tables. Instead of having to roll back each individual table, you could just roll back the catalog to before um, the problems occurred. Okay, making just working with that time travel at a catalog level much, much easier. Okay, also the project is just very open. Bottom line is all discussions regarding the project are generally in open channels. So uh, over the email list uh, where you can see conversations about new features, um, the, the the Slack channel, uh, the, uh, the Slack channel, email list, 
And there's one more that I'm thinking. Oh, there's the public meetings. Every couple of weeks, there's a public meeting that anyone can participate in. So bottom line is anyone can participate in the conversation about how the format evolves. It's a very um, community-run project. It started out on Netflix, but now you have companies like Apple, Dremio, and so many more who are constantly contributing to the project and trying to um, help it advance, okay, to create this sort of standard way of having tables in the data lake, okay, that, that everyone can have a say in, okay, versus, you know, other formats where sometimes a lot of conversations aren't necessarily public and transparent, so oftentimes you might get surprised that new features are coming. You'll never be surprised that there's a new feature in Apache Iceberg because those conversations are public and visible well ahead of time. So you always know sort of what's happening. So it gives you, um, as a company, a, more than enough time to plan for what's coming in Apache Iceberg and to be always be able to ease into uh, the format as it evolves and know what's sort of coming, what your timelines are, things like that. Now, a key thing, once you adopt Apache Iceberg or want to adopt Apache Iceberg, one of the key choices you have to make is the catalog. How are you going to track your tables? Okay, because this basically... Every catalog kind of works differently. Um, the story is getting better, but the question is that while many tools can read and write Apache Iceberg, not every tool can read and write to every catalog. So there are different choices you have for a catalog. Okay, so there's Project Nessie, which is that open source project that gives like Git-like functionality to your Iceberg tables at a catalog level. Okay, giving you catalog level rollback, time travel. Okay, and the nice thing about Project Nessie is that you don't have to deploy it if you don't want to. You could use Dremio, and Dremio actually has a cloud-managed version, as called Dremio Arctic Catalogs, that are part of the Dremio Cloud product uh, that basically give you that catalog for your iceberg tables that you can bring to tools like Apache Iceberg. Um, basically, uh, Dremio Arctic work or, or Project Nessie works with Dremio. It works with Apache Spark, with Apache Flink, and several others. Okay, so you can then uh, move those tables and use those tables in multiple places and use those Git-like features. Okay. Um, so that's a really great option. Other options include the Hive Metastore. Okay, so if you already are on-prem and you're using a Hive Metastore already, probably oftentimes the path of least resistance is just to use your existing Hive Metastore as your catalog. Okay, AWS Glue, if you're in the AWS ecosystem, makes a lot of sense to use AWS Glue as your Iceberg Metastore because you're already interacting with a lot of different Iceberg uh, AWS tools. Um, although then the Catch-22 doesn't necessarily interop as well with anything outside the AWS ecosystem works pretty well with Dremio, but um, you know, uh, if you're using, if you're in a multi-cloud environment, that may not be the best option. Uh, Hadoop. Okay. You can use what's, they call it the Hadoop catalog, which is probably a misnomer because really it just means the file system catalog. This would mean if you're just writing the files raw to S3, HDFS, ADLS. So you could, it basically means no catalog. Okay, and you can write tables with no catalog. Um, the only catch is that when you're using certain object storage providers, there are some guarantees that aren't there. So then you're running into some consistency risk when you have multiple writers if you don't use a catalog like the ones over here. Okay, there are other catalog options like JDBC, DynamoDB, Snowflake, LakeFS, REST catalog, a variety of catalogs. Okay, Mustafa? Yeah, I have a question from the consumption pattern. Like, let's assume the data analysts, like, they need to query uh, the catalog to build their queries over our data lake or our lake house. So, like, tools like uh, Power BI, Tableau, and this stuff, what would be the best option for them to integrate with? Like, assume they, they are not on AWS, because I know AWS catalog, but outside AWS wallet, what would be the best option for them in this case? In this case, it would be more based on the engine that you're using because uh, Iceberg itself isn't going to be able to like serve the BI dashboard because it's just the format. There's going to need to be a query engine in the middle of some sort uh, that then queries a table and then passes that data to Power BI. So if you're using Dremio, then any of these options work. Uh, Dremio works really well for for BI dashboards. It's very popular when working. It actually has a little button for Power BI and Tableau where you just click it and it just takes that data. And the nice thing about when you're using uh, that is you also get the, the data virtualization and you can connect all sorts of other data sources along with your iceberg tables. Um, if you're, uh, you could also use Torino. embedded. Oh, go for it. Torino or Athena. Uh, I bet you Torino or Athena uh, as, as an option for the SQL engine would be integrated native now with all the iceberg catalog features. Uh, yeah. So Project Nessie um, does support Presto, Trino, Flink, Dremio. So all of those are all supported 
uh, by that. But basically, it would be the query engine that that handles like serving to the BI. So the question would be, what is my query engine, and which catalogs does it support? Now, in a situation where you're just serving the BI dashboard directly from your laptop, you might be using something like uh, DuckDB. Um, I now I don't think I forget exactly what DuckDB's level of catalog support is, but a lot of those like single node tools like Polar, like Polars. What they'll do instead is like even if you don't have, they can't connect to your catalog since you're just doing a read-only uh, query. What you can do is you can point the tool just to the metadata file, the whatever. You, so if you know what the newest metadata file is, you just tell it, "Hey, there's a metadata file," and it's still able to read the table because it got access to the metadata file. Is you would have to explicitly tell it what the newest metadata file is. Um, so um, that's all again continuously advancing. So sh that story should just. Like the, probably in a year or so, the catalogs are wouldn't necessarily be a concern anymore because there'll be much more standardization across catalogs. Um, but that would be the question. So basically you think, okay, hey, what is the query engine tool you're going to use to serve the BI dashboards? And then what catalogs does that support? Those are the catalogs that I would want to use to track my iceberg tables. Okay. So uh, the main focus would be, for example, if I'm using... Presto, for example, is Presto integrate with, integrates with um, uh, Iceberg, so that's fine. But if I use other tools, so I need to make sure they support the integration between as uh, they can read Iceberg tables or not. This is the main focus I have to... Two see, things. Check. Can it read Iceberg tables and which catalogs can it connect to? Okay. Because, so for example, um, like... I don't think Presto or Trino or Dremio have acts, can read the, are, are able to connect to the LakeFS catalog. So I could be writing I could be writing my iceberg tables using Spark to the LakeFS catalog, but then what happens is that when I try to run a query in Trino, Dremio, or Presto, I can't connect to that catalog. So even though Presto can read iceberg tables, it won't be able to see those tables. It won't be able to discover those tables to read them because it can't connect to the catalog. So that's the that's the main question. So you generally want to choose a catalog that has broad support. Um, so generally, like. The nice thing, like again, it depends. It depends on your system. Again, if you're in AWS, probably AWS Glue is going to be a really good choice. Uh, generally, if you're just if you're agnostic, I think Project Nancy Dremio Arctic is a pretty solid choice because you can deploy it on your own. So basically, you always have the option of just being able to create your own instance of Dream of, of Project Nancy. Uh, but you also get those Git like features. So now I can actually branch my whole catalog. So I can create a, a dupl I can create a copy of my catalog without creating a copy of my catalog. I can create zero copy environments. Uh, that people can experiment in, isolate ingestion, things like that. that. That's something that you can't really do with any other catalog. It's making it sort of particularly unique. Yeah, thank you. Cool, cool. Okay. Um, and then another thing to mention is that you might start with one catalog, but then decide to move to another catalog. So you might start with Hive Metastore because that's the easiest thing to start off with if you already have a Hive Metastore, but may want to graduate to something like a Project Nessie. Oh, sorry. My mouse is... Uh, particularly having fun today. But um, you may want to move to like a Project Nessie or an AWS Glue, okay? There is a register table procedure where basically you can say, hey, let me take the table from that, ca that catalog and move it over to this catalog. So there's a way to migrate tables between catalogs pretty easily. There's actually a migration tool that you would just basically enter the credentials for both catalogs and it'll transfer all the tables from one catalog to another. So... Um, the best thing to do is just get started, you know, get started with whatever works with the, your, the tools that you're currently working with. And then again, if later on you want to migrate to a different solution, there are paths to do that that aren't particularly, it's not going to be a particularly difficult endeavor because you don't have to move the data. You would just change, you would just basically make copies of all those references into a different catalog. And again, I mentioned Project Nessie, which pro provides those Git-like features just to kind of see how that works. This is like what a Nessie catalog do. So again, query engines and ETL tools like Spark, Dremio, Presto, Trino, uh, Flink can all communicate to a Nessie catalog. Well, what would happen is that I would have each commit is basically a list of all my tables with the reference to where that metadata exists, but I can create branches. So if I want to make a change to a table, I could create a commit or a branch. And then if I make a change to that branch, so you see here, I've updated table B. So now that's on snapshot two. If a query comes in from my end of line users, they're still going to see this because right now the main branch is still here. So I can do my changes. I can go do quality tests on my changes, do all sorts of um, quality assurance work without having to worry about whether the data is being visible to the end user before I'm done cleaning it up and making sure that it's ready for them. 
And then when I'm done doing that work, I can then just do a merge transaction, a merge, and I can merge the changes across all of the tables in the branch back into the main line. So the nice thing about this is that while there is branching and merging native in the iceberg format, and that's on a per table level. So if you want to create transactions across multiple tables, which could be done across multiple tools, you can isolate all that work on a branch using a project Nessie catalog. So that way you can then uh, integrate that afterwards, which brings you sort of lots of different benefits. So you can like isolate, allows you to isolate changes to your table. So that way you can do uh, quality and data validation. You can do no copy experimentation, uh, enables multi-table transactions, which typically was something you could only do on a data warehouse. And the cool thing is that it's not like your traditional multi-table transaction. So if you're using like something like a Snowflake, what you would do is you do like a begin transaction. You would do a bunch of things right away and then do an end transaction. The thing is that you can just do changes across multiple tools anytime you want. And none of those changes are going to be visible until you eventually merge that branch. So you get a lot more flexibility as far as doing multiple transactions across multiple tables. You can roll back the catalog. You can tag the catalog. So you could do like a tag at the end of each month so that we can reproduce the state of the entire catalog of tables, uh, you know, basically say, hey, this is my end of month tag so that we can go back and always query the table as it was. And we're all consistently querying the table as it was at the end of the previous month because we chose a specific commit to be the one that we represent as our end of month commit kind of thing. So we can tag and create very, make our, our data very reproducible. Okay. And then again, Nessie specifically offers this these kind of benefits at the catalog level because again, they do exist at the table level to an extent. Um, and then there's other solutions for like the file level, but this provides catalog level operations, which allows you to really kind of do everything with SQL, which is pretty nice. Nessie is open source, um, but if you want a cloud managed service, there's Dremio Arctic. Um, it's cloud agnostic, so you can use it with Azure, AWS, Google, it doesn't matter where you store the data, uh, it doesn't matter which cloud you're using, um, if you're using a standalone Nessie server. Um, and then again, it has its own access control and cleanup feature. So you can, so it allows you to make those tables portable and secure. And in that, when it comes to getting started with Iceberg, one of the tools that really goes out of its way to try to facilitate working with Iceberg is Dremio. Dremio makes Iceberg very easy. Basically, we have all the SQL you need uh, to work with Iceberg tables in a really easy to use format. Uh, when we do like our demonstration of how to use Iceberg uh, in a future episode, you'll see this more hands-on, but you have DDL, so you can create your Iceberg tables from Dremio, uh, alter them, so we, you can do that partition evolution, schema evolution, all from uh, the Dremio interface. Uh, you have a copy into command, so that way if you want to copy data from like CSV files or JSON files or Parquet files and copy those records into an existing Iceberg table, it's much easier because you have this command uh, copy into. It makes it really easy to kind of just regularly ingest that data in that form. Uh, you have DML like merge into commands so that we can do easy upserts. Um, we, you can, again, it, when you query data with Dremio, because Dremio has been using Iceberg for years. Okay. I mean, um, Dremio is really, really optimized for Apache Iceberg tables. So it really takes advantage of the partitioning and whatnot. So uh, you have commands for optimizing those tables. So again, Every, as you create more and more files, you may end up with a lot of little small parquet files, and you might want to do uh, what's called compaction to take those small files and turn them into fewer big files for better performance. And Dremio, you can do that through SQL pretty easily in Dremio using this optimize command. Okay, uh, You can clean up the historical snapshots using the vacuum command. So the nice thing about this is you can do a lot of the work with Iceberg uh, without necessarily having to spin up a Spark cluster to do a lot of this optimization. Uh, Mustafa? I have like uh, some questions. Uh, first, like you mentioned, Dremio, and uh, I'm not sure if all uh, the audience know about Dremio. Dremio is, is a SQL engine or it's a platform? Uh, like how, how do we define well, Dremio in this yeah. case? Uh, Dremio, <laughs> Dremio is a data lakehouse platform. So at its core, you have a SQL engine. Um, that So basically, if you're familiar with Trino, think of, think of that, but much, much more sort of iceberg centric. Um, so a couple of things that distinguish Dremio. Dremio is faster because it is built top to bottom using Apache Arrow for processing. Uh, actually, Apache Arrow in its early stages was the in-memory format for Dremio before it was open source to be Apache Arrow. It actually started out at Dremio. Um, so it's so basically, it processes the data really, really fast. Uh, two, um, you can connect to multiple sources. So you can connect to databases, data warehouses, along with your data lake. So in this case, it also becomes a platform where I can join my iceberg tables with Snowflake tables. I can join them with Delta Lake tables. I can join them with my SQL tables. 
uh, from a SQL server or Postgres. Um, so it becomes a place where you can unify all that data, uh, curate it, and deliver it for things like BI dashboards, whatnot. So, uh, and it creates a really nice user interface. And when we do the uh, hands-on exercise, we'll actually get hands-on. We'll spin up Dremio on our laptops so we can actually see uh, how working with Iceberg from there is and see what happens when you create an Iceberg table uh, using Dremio looks like um, to get hands-on. And we could like do some functionality like Spark using Dremio. So if I need to do some SQL operations, I could automate this through Dremio to apply this part, right? Like rather than writing some special Spark code or something like this, correct? Yep, yep. So basically what you would do is you would just log into Dremio and then you would just run SQL. Um, would make, basically, it's a much more sort of intuitive way that um, it's much more SQL oriented. Now, as far as like automation, usually one what people will do, like the typical pattern with Dremio is very, well, you can do ETL and ELT. Uh, ELT works really, really well with Dremio because what you can do is you can land the raw data into your data lake as Apache Iceberg tables. And then instead of just doing all these transformations and additional copies, additional copy, you curate a semantic layer of, of views on top of that. And Dremio is really fast, so it'll be very performant. And then it has this feature called reflections that essentially automates the acceleration pipelines you would normally write. So if I have like three layers of views, and then there's this particular view that's not performing enough, I can just flip a switch called reflections, and then Dremio abstracts away normally like the kind of pipelines you would write to create like materialized views or BI extracts or things like that, and maintains that for you. So that way you can satisfy those types of requests much quicker. Also things like, let's say a user wants to add a column, the user interface, it makes it really easy for the end user to say, okay, hey, I just need to add this column. Let me just create a view that adds that column myself. So that way the data engineer on the other end isn't as backed up with all these requests for smaller things. Um, so it's really built to be a very self-service platform with Iceberg as sort of its central format. And actually when you, when you do those reflections it's actually using Iceberg tables to accelerate your queries. Okay, uh, I have one last question about the previous slide. How like iceberg like compact small files? Like, uh, like is this like a process which based on the metadata, they try to merge these files based on the size, or how this happens? Um, basically, what it's going to do is, I mean, the actual algorithm will be slightly different depending on which tool you're using. Um, but uh, the essential idea is that it's going to take a look at the rules you have. So in this case, I'm saying, hey, I want, I don't want any files lower than 100 megs and no more than 1,000 megs. So what it'll do is it'll scan each partition and take a look at the file sizes for all those files and figure out how to best within each partition rewrite those files uh, within those parameters. So basically, if I have like, in this case, I have, well, let's pretend like in one partition, I have three files that are 50 megs. OK, I might compact two of those um, and make 100 meg file. And the 50 meg file will still remain in that partition because there's nothing else to compact it with. Or actually, I would compact all three and just make 100, 150 meg file. Um, so depending on my parameters, it's going to try the best combine the files within each partition. Um, because generally, the, the manifest and manifest list, generally, all the data is kind of segregated by partition for the most part. OK, thank you. Cool, 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 cool. And then vacuum here, I would just basically say, hey, I. Basically, what happens is that every time you update an iceberg table, you're keeping all that data. So that adds up over time. So you may not want to keep, like, this is where, like, sometimes people's costs creep up in Snowflake. Because in Snowflake, or really any cloud data warehouse, you're paying more for storage. And what people don't realize is that every time they make an updated table, they're tracking, like, let's say, like, 90 days of history. So they don't realize, like, every change, you're, you're increasing the amount of historical data you're storing. Um, so even if you delete a record, you're essentially increasing the amount of storage you're storing uh, in, in that warehouse. So your cost keeps going up and up and up in storage, regardless of what you do with the data. Um, so that's the case. Um, that, again, that would be the same case on a data lake. When you're doing transactions, you're still tracking all that all those historical snapshots that have that time travel. But you can clean that up by just saying, hey, I don't want any snapshots older than this point. So you can set up your own rules. Uh, and then also just storage on a data lake is cheaper in the first place. So you can still get that same form, but at a much lower price point. And it's much more under your control. Although Dremio does have this, can automate this for you. So if you have your iceberg tables in a Dremio Arctic catalog, um, you can actually flip a switch and it'll automatically run the optimize command for you on an interval that you choose. And it'll automatically run the vacuum command for you on you choose. So that way your tables are just maintained. They're fast, they're clean, and you're not storing too much data. So um, a lot of those things, 
So then it becomes really more, again, it, you truly end up with a data a data lake house where it feels like a data warehouse. Because when you use a data warehouse, you oftentimes aren't thinking about the optimization of the data. You just write your tables in, you query your tables, you deliver your data to your BI dashboards. Dremio really goes out of its way to try to give you all the tools to replicate that feel. So you can read and write iceberg tables, um, but also again, it'll automate it, all that stuff under the hood. So that way, once you have all that automate, uh, those automated optimizations under the hood turned on, your tables are just your tables and you just work with them like if you're working with other, any other database, but the data is stored in your data lake and is accessible. Those same tables can then be accessed by any other tool you use, whether it's Trino, Presto, um, Spark, Flink, et cetera. So it's not, you're using that open format that creates that open ecosystem and your tools aren't like locked in one place, but you still have the feel and benefits of those other platforms. Okay, so again, Dremio works with a lot of catalogs. So you can see here, we work with a lot of different iceberg catalogs. Um, we can work with your iceberg tables on object storage. So I, I, Dremio is really, really flexible and it's also really, really fast, um, which is why it's really, really popular for oftentimes anytime when people have like, have slowed BI dashboards, they wanna speed up or they wanna serve their BI dashboards directly from their data lake. That's oftentimes where it's, it's really popular. As I mentioned, uh, Dremio, uh, Dremio kind of can manage your lake house. So this is what this is talking about. Dremio Arctic is part of our data lake house management features that basically optimize your iceberg tables. So they allow you to create those Arctic catalogs, which are those Nessie based catalogs, which allows you to kind of create portable governance of your tables, automatically optimize your tables, automatically clean up your tables all from sort of one place. So overall, it's a great way to, to use iceberg. Um, and again, when we'll do the demonstration of how of working with iceberg right from your laptop, um, you'll see it, like you'll see it in action. But essentially, when you're constructing your lake house, essentially the, the the epitome of what you would want your lake house to be, or how it should work for like maximum optimization, or something like this. Essentially, you would have your data sources. Okay, and then you'd have your ETL pipelines, which could be using Apache Spark to do your ETL. You could be using Apache Flink if you're doing streaming. Um, you know, whatever the tool of your choice is to get the data into iceberg you would land the raw data in your data lake. So this would be your, in this case, maybe your S3, your S3 data lake. And then you may use like uh, Dremio Arctic or Nessie as your catalog. So that's how you would land the tables in there. And again, the benefit here is you have the automated table optimization. So then you don't have to think about that part. It just, it's automatic. So essentially you would land the data in iceberg, your, the raw data, and then you would practice a, sort of a more ELT type pattern where you, but instead of transforming the data, what you're doing is you're doing the transformations virtually through Dremio semantic layer. So Dremio has a semantic layer where you can curate views so that we can make, make create all the different versions of your data without creating copies of the data. Um, you can write documentation for your data so that way people can see documentation for each data set right there on the Dremio platform and you get your fast queries. And then all your end users can then access the data that you give them permissions to uh, using either Aeroflight, a REST API, JDBC, ODBC, or just connect directly to the Dremio UI, which can be used for like self-service data set preparation, uh, analytics applications, notebooks, BI dashboards, ad hoc analytics. Um, and this just makes it where basically you have this sort of apparatus that's kind of, again, feels a lot like using a data warehouse at a fraction of the cost uh, much faster. And that's all enabled because you have table formats like Apache Iceberg that allow tools like Dremio, like Presto, like Trino, like Spark, like Flink, to be able to all communicate with the same data without you having to make a copy into each. Because if I had five databases, I'd have to make a copy of the data into each database. But with Iceberg, I can have one copy of the data in my data lake and all these tools can see those tables uh, equally. And that's the beauty uh, of Apache Iceberg. And this just gives you, again, one way you could design a data lake house um, where you're minimizing the amount of copy, minimizing the storage, minimizing the compute, um, et cetera. Um, but yeah, so that is that is an introduction to Apache Iceberg and what's possible with Apache Iceberg um, and some of the tools that work with Apache Iceberg. Uh, my name is Alex Merced. Um, again, I'll just go back to one of our earlier slides in case you guys want to scan that QR code to do the exercise. So again, if we go all the way back to the beginning, okay. There is this QR code right here, and this will walk you through an exercise where you can actually spin up a little mini data lake house on your laptop to actually see it end to end and actually see what it's like to run that SQL, to create uh, Apache iceberg tables, to take a look at what the files look like that it creates, um, to run time travel and do like branching and merging with your catalog to see how all of that works and how all that feels um, to kind of see what the value of the Apache iceberg lake house is. But with that, uh, thank you guys for having me and I'll answer any questions.
Um, thanks, Alex, for presenting Iceberg for us today. It was very nice. Um, I have one last question here. Uh, when people like think about the transaction data leak format, they think about Iceberg or similar tools. But sometimes now we see you and other um, architects in the data platform say, even if you don't have the the use case for update or delete, you have to use Iceberg or similar tools for your data leak because of the performance and because of you will save a lot of cost and reduce the, uh, I would say, operational overhead for managing mm -hmm. the data leak. So what do you think about this point? Um, it depends. I mean, I think it's still good to write your data in Apache Iceberg for a couple different reasons. Um, not performance, perf I mean, You'll start to, if if you if you basically if you only have if you have no partitioning, um, it's only if and it's basically let's say you let's say your data set's a single parquet file, then you're not going to get too much benefit because it's a single parquet file. It's once you start having more than one parquet file that equals one data set that you're going to start seeing the benefit of a table format as far as performance goes because then it can do that pruning of files. Uh, but that's not the only reason. I, even if I have one parquet file, there are benefits because it maybe I just want to have time travel. So as it writes multiple versions of that same time, it's nice to have the ability to be able to go back and create the same version without me having to know which file has the right version that I want. I just create the table. Um, there's also the, the, but again, as you have more and more files, that metadata is going to help improve the performance of your queries. Also the portability. Using a table format like uh, like Apache Iceberg and collecting them all in a catalog, is just much a much, much neater way for me to go bring my tables from tool to tool. Because then I just go to Spark, I can just put in my catalog credentials when I configure Iceberg, and all my tables are immediately visible. I don't have to go register each individual table in some way. They're just there and ready to work with. Um, so there's conveniences that you get from working with a format like Iceberg. Um, again, I wouldn't say, like especially for smaller tables, the benefit, I wouldn't say, is always Im uh, immediately performance. Because, again, if I had a single Parquet file, it'd probably just be faster to read the Parquet file because then you're skipping the whole step of reading the metadata. Um, but um, as soon as you start getting into multiple files, especially when you start taking advantage of things like partitioning and sorting the data, you're gonna get a lot of benefit um, out of Iceberg. But performance isn't the only reason. There's a lot of just quality of life benefits you get from working with the table in an Iceberg format, such as time travel, the ability to roll back, things like that. Okay. One last question here for me is about the metadata. Uh, my understanding is the metadata are all in JSON formats as a file. Is this like could be a challenge compared to, I know Hive has a lot of issues, but I mean, Hive, the metadata is in RDBMS. Is this any difference between having the metadata as a file compared to um, uh, RDBMS? There are some benefits. I mean, the primarily benefit is you're not running a service. So like if I'm running a DBMS, I got to pay to run that 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 database system to track that. Um, so the nice thing about having all of that in just files that are my data lake, there's absolutely no ongoing cost to having that iceberg table. That iceberg table exists. It's readable uh, on my storage. So theoretically, even if I turned off my catalog, because usually your catalog is going to be a service, whether it's Nessie or a database, you can use a JDBC catalog. Um, even if you are using those, you could theoretically turn those off. I could still read that table with polars by just pointing it to the metadata file. And there's no there, I, there's no ongoing cost of just having that table exist. Um, so then that's why at the core, that's the purpose of the standard. The idea is to create a standard for how the file, how the table is written to, to storage. And then everything else is everything else is outside of that standard. So the catalog is technically outside of the specification. Uh, how, and then how the catalog works outside of the specification. It's just, how do we write these files? And then they see that now, now that table is now persisted and there's no, you know, it just exists. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we will have uh, a, new theory, a new video about the uh, demo. So thanks everyone. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next video. Thank you.